Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks to Bids for having me. Thanks, uh, everyone, for coming. Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, let's see which one of these. Oh, this needs to be on, huh? Yeah. And yes. Uh, work I've been doing with Richard McElry uh, over at UC Davis. Um, when we got to, to talking about sort of, I guess, fundamental issues in in doing science, uh, sort of broad stroke, and uh, through a series of conversations, embarked on the path that led us to the paper that I'm going to talk about. Um, so I want to open with something uh, that seems a little tangential, which is uh, medical testing for chromosomal disorders. All right. So this is a um, the maternity 21 blood test is a pretty new procedure. Uh, my wife had it when we had, when she was pregnant with our baby. This is a, a blood test which um, separates fetal DNA from the mother's blood, and it's used as a pre-screening for trisomies like uh, Down syndrome and Edwards syndrome, uh, sort of extra chromosome disorders. Um, and I read this article, I actually read it in the Boston Globe, but it was in uh, the work of the New England Center for Investigative Reporting. Um, and they were concerned because uh, they found that about 6% of women uh, who had tested positive for Edwards syndrome were getting abortions uh, without any further testing. Uh, so Edwards syndrome, which is trisomy 18, is a really horrible uh, genetic disorder. Um, most uh, fetuses don't actually make it to full term. Most of those who do don't make it past their first year of life. Um, so it's, it's, you know, if abortion is on the table at all, it's definitely on the table if you're sure that, uh, that Edwards syndrome is present. Um, the article that I read was uh, sort of taking the the pharmaceutical company or the biomedical company that, that does the test to task because they, they claim a 99% detection rate for this disorder. Um, but then the journalist was saying, well, but you know, when they did studies uh, and uh, the invasive amniocentesis screening, et cetera, they found that only about 64% of the women who had an initial positive test uh, ended up positive. So clearly, this is a, a discrepancy. They claim 99% accuracy, but really, there's only 64% accuracy. Um, the problem is that that's equating two things that are not equivalent. Right? Uh, the probability that something is gets a positive result, given that it's true, is not the same thing as the probability that something is true, given there's a positive result. Right? This is something I, I don't think I you know, need to get uh, that deep into it. Um, you know, I, I went around and looked up the, base, the estimated base rate is that Edwards syndrome is present in about one in every 2,500 pregnancies. Uh, so we can throw these numbers into Bayes' theorem and say there's a false positive rate of about two in 10,000. And two in 10,000 is great. It means you know, 10,000, uh, you know, or in 5,000 tests, only one is going to have a false positive. Uh, but that's still enough to get you only 64% certainty when you get a positive test. Uh, and there's actually not a ton of data on Edwards syndrome. Um, there's a lot more data on Down syndrome, for which the best false positive rates are more like uh, 2 in 1,000. Uh, and if that's the case, then the probability that there's actually uh, the syndrome given a positive result is only about 16 percent. All right, so why have I bummed everybody out about Edwards syndrome? Uh, it's because I think there's a lot of parallels to be drawn about the scientific process. All right, so as scientists, we try to, we use experiments to uh, try to figure out the true state of the world. Right? And we might get a negative result and be angry. Or there might be good news, and we get a positive result, and our hypothesis is supported. Uh, but as scientists, we're faced with the exact same problem that clinicians are when they're doing these tests. We have a result, and it's an indicator 
of truth. But all we have is the positive result, and we're trying to correlate our result with the true state of the world. And there's a further advantage that the clinicians have in which these tests come out of clinical trials in which thousands, hopefully, at least hundreds usually, are of uh, replications and studies are done, and we, they aggregate the data the same tests over and over and over again. So the relationship between a result and the presence of the condition can be estimated pretty well. As scientists, we're investigating novel hypotheses. Our tests aren't necessarily uh, as well calibrated. We can estimate things like power and false positive rate, but things like base rate, which is the background rate of you know, a priori probability that a hypothesis is true, is much harder to estimate. Um, so when, we, when people get educated about uh, how to do research uh, in grad school, I mean, uh, I was taught you know, the, the things to look for are power and false positive rate, these are the type one and type two errors. Right? We want to minimize both kinds of errors. Of course, if, you know, if we get no type one errors, then we're very prone to type two errors and vice versa. Uh, but you know, we use, well, this is getting less and less now, but you know, we set P to 0.05, and we hope for a power of about 0.8. And that does all right for us, but the thing that we uh, generally ignore is the base rate, which is the probability before you've done any studies that what we're gonna test might be true. Uh, so just to give a sort of toy example, this is the sort of uh, you know, power of 0.8, alpha of 0.5. Um, this seems like a pretty good, most scientists I think, or at least most social scientists would be very willing to accept these kinds of numbers. And so imagine we have 100 hypotheses that we're testing and only 10 of them are true. There's a base rate of 0.1. That's pretty good. If every relationship we think might be present, one in 10 is there, that's not bad. Uh, so we do all our studies and 80% of the true ones come back positive and 5% of the false ones come back positive. But there's still way more false positive, false hypotheses than true hypotheses. So in this case, we have about 62% of our positive results are actually true, which means almost 40% of them, the things we have positive results for, are actually false things that we think might be true because we got a positive result. This is not bad, but it's, it is a discrepancy, and these are conditions that are pretty positive, pretty optimistic about the state of science, and still only 60% of our initial positive results uh, should we expect to be actually true states of the world. All right, and everything I said is basically in this paper that John Ioannidis uh, published 10 years ago, uh, which is why most published research findings are false. And he was specifically addressing the medical community, things like whole genome association tests where they have, you're testing 100,000 SNPs for a relationship between uh, you know, genes and some medical condition where you might expect that five or 10 genes are actually associated with. So you, in that case, the base rate right, is one in 10,000, which is a lot less than one in, one in 10. Um, and this is a graph which is not in his paper, but should be, uh, which is basically just, this is the base rate. This is our assumed background rate of true hypotheses in the field that we're testing. And this is assuming a false positive rate of 5%, and each, this is, uh, the y, uh, x axis is on a log scale here. And the y axis is the post study probability that the hypothesis is true given a positive result. Uh, and again, throughout this whole thing, I'm going to be using things like positive result uh, and true in a very sort of binary way, which is clearly an oversimplification. Um, but uh, as a sort of first pass model of science, it's sort of what I'm going for. Um, what's, what's clear here is that this, there's a thin gray line through the middle of that uh, graph, and that's 50% probability. And what you can see is even when the power is 99%, or even if it's 100%, we, we always get a positive result for true hypotheses. If our base rate is below about 5%, then most positive findings 
will be wrong, will be related to true, uh, to false, false hypotheses. All right. Um, the base rate, there's good evidence that the base rate is actually pretty low in a lot of fields, right? There's false positives, you know, that crop up again and again. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with some of these. This is uh, on the upper left is the, the dead salmon experiment where they put a, a dead salmon in an MRI scanner and uh, showed it uh, neutral and emotionally valenced images and got a, a positive, uh, statistically significant uh, bold signal uh, right in the middle of the salmon's brain, and that salmon had been dead for quite some time. Uh, I put, uh, this is the Daryl Bam's 2011 paper in JPSP where he uh, presented evidence for precognition, which is a, just an amazing paper uh, in, in the sense that, uh, in, in every sense of the word. Um, <laughs> literally unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and then there was a, this paper in Nature, uh, it's kind of a perspectives piece that Begley and Ellis uh, talked about. Uh, Amgen, the biotech company, did, uh, tried to replicate 53 what they co considered landmark studies in oncology and hematology and found that uh, 47 out of 53 failed to replicate. Um, most of those studies were published in places, the initial studies were published in places like Nature, Science, Cell. Um, so we know that there's a lot of false positives out there, right? Uh, some of you may have seen this just recently. This is the Many Labs group, where they took a whole bunch of well-known, well-cited psychology experiments. And what's great about this paper is they were looking for uh, what uh, some psychologists can uh, call the semester effect, which is the, uh, the results should be different whether or not the subjects are tested at the beginning of the semester or the end of the semester uh, for whatever reason you could throw at them. Uh, what they, they found very little evidence for a semester effect, but also they found very little evidence for most of the main effects that these studies reported. Uh, so um, the upper right at the top is the Stroop effect. Stroop, uh, so rock solid. Soup total, uh, Stroop totally replicates. Uh, most other things, so the green triangles here are the, uh, rep is the reported effect size in the initial published studies. And they got 20 uh, psychology labs to independently replicate each of these studies. And so uh, the X's are each of those labs results. The uh, blue dot is the uh, sort of mean and standard error of those results. And yeah, the vast, the majority of the studies failed to replicate. All right. Um, so there's a lot of false positives. Um, but clearly I'm talking about replication, right? Uh, this is not an impossible situation. Um, right, what about replication? Um, this has been, a lot of people are talking about this, including this uh, group here. If we, you know, we just, we have to replicate things. It's really important to replicate. Um, this is how science advances. And it's been nice to see that, you know, replications are starting to get published most of them in places like PLOS One, but uh, also in some real uh, sort of uh, classic Elsevier journals and psychology journals, other kinds of mainstream journals. I really like this one on the left. This is uh, Brown, Schmidt, and Horton because they published a failure to replicate their own study. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so we just, we just need to uh, support replication and things will be better. Um, but it's not that easy, right? Because People are very concerned about exactly how we're going to do replication. How are we going to uh, publish replications? How are we going to assess replications? Uh, so the, basically, there are two things here. One is, um, well, they're kind of two sides of the same coin. Uh, one is that replications don't get published. Negative results don't get published as well. Uh, people aren't publishing things when they fail to find a positive result. Uh, this is um, these two. Uh, the Upper left and lower right, these papers came out pretty recently saying uh, people don't publish negative results and increasingly so. They used to publish more negative results, they publish less and less now. Uh, and this is not just the, uh, the Franco et al. study that came out last year. 
um, indicates that this is not at the level of the journals primarily. This is at the level of the labs. They're just not even submitting negative results. Um, then you have um, uh, other people basically saying, well, if a fail if some uh, study fails to replicate, then that's not a big deal. We, sh we shouldn't really bother about that uh, because replications um, are tend to be lower powered than the initial study. Uh, they don't have all the lab expertise of the initial study. They, they might be just doing things a little bit differently. This is certainly true in, let's say, biochemistry, where you have to mix very careful solutions or have lab conditions. There's a social psychologist, Jason Mitchell, who got some press for putting this article just on his website where he claimed that failures to replicate are absolutely worthless and should never be published. They serve no point in science. Um, I, yeah, he's very, he was, you should read his, uh, his article. It's still on his website. Yeah. No, I mean, well, I think he, he makes an, imp uh, he makes a very careful argument that I think is based on some wrong assumptions, but um, but clearly this is, I mean, he's not a stupid guy. And um, the, this is uh, Mina Bissell, who's here at Berkeley um, on the lower left. And I think she makes a very reasonable claim for why some replications would have a lower power than the initial, uh, initial studies, right? So uh, with all of this sort of background in mind, this brings up to the questions that we tackled this, our study with, right? which is one, what is the evidential value of replication? Uh, what is the impact of communication and publication bias? Uh, different kinds of strategies. Should we publish everything? Should we publish only positive uh, replications? Uh, if science is an invisible hand that self-corrects over time, uh, how much replication do we actually need? And then, uh, you know, how bad is it if replications are underpowered uh, relative to initial studies, are they still worth something? All right, so uh, I'm gonna take you through a sort of schematic of the model that we're working with. This is a, a mathematical model that Richard and I built that starts out with a sort of uh, cycle of scientists. We have a population of scientists and step one is uh, the scientist chooses a hypothesis to study. Uh, the hypothesis either, uh, sorry, the scientist either takes a totally new novel hypothesis or replicates a previous result um, with probability R, which is the rate of replication. And we get more into different kinds of replication later, but starting with this. Uh, and s of those novel hypotheses, some of them will be true and some of them will be false. And this is the base rate is the probability that they're true. And then of the tested hypotheses, some of those will actually be true, some of them will actually be false, uh, but we don't know what their true epistemic state is. All we know is the results of our studies, which accrue. And we assume that scientists can keep track of the difference between the positive and negative results. So they keep a sort of tally, which gets added one every time a positive result happens and minus one every time a negative result happens. And this is our sort of strong assumption of the way that our sort of fictional science world is happening. All right, so after choosing a hypothesis, uh, there's an investigation. And uh, the true, the real truth of the hypothesis interacts with the probability of a positive or negative result. Uh, no, the size of the circle there is, so there's sort of, it's harder to see here, there's sort of rings around it, which just indicate the, you know, the, the most recent result. So you have, you know, uh, a red ring is a negative result and a green ring, you're adding to, yeah. So each of, so the novel hypotheses have a, like a sort of gray shell, which means we don't have no idea about the epistemic state. And then uh, the tested hypotheses, we have the results that have been published. Yeah, so this is a sort of schematic in actual, in the model itself. Uh, the researchers don't know 
the, the absolute number of studies that have been done. They only know the number of positive results minus the number of negative results. Uh, and it turns out mathematically that is, it doesn't matter. Um, because you're not a, so it's not a probability distribution um, for like that's over all the real numbers. It's just a probability of truth versus the probability of falseness. Um, but we can, I can talk more about that later. Um, so uh, there's an investigation step, and with power one minus beta, a true hypothesis gets a positive result. With false positive rate alpha, a false hypothesis gets a positive result, and then the inverses of those for negative results. After the results happen, there's a communication stage. Uh, we assume as sort of baseline, all novel positive results are communicated or published. And then everything else is published with some probability related to its state, whether it's a novel result or a replication, and whether it's a positive result or a negative result. And so you can see here some Sometimes novel results uh, that are negative go into, this is, you know, our, there's our file drawer there where people aren't publishing negative results. Um, and only communicated results uh, transfer new information to the, state, to the set of tested hypotheses. Um, and so there's this sort of C uh, parameters for communication probabilities uh, that we have here. So this is the sort of basic dynamics of the model, and it just repeats over time. Um, yeah. So you have all negative novel tests? No. So negative novel results get published with, with probability C sub n minus. So where's positive So basically, what's happening here is, uh, so Yeah, so it's on the, on, the le on the very left is positive novel results. Right. And so the, the dashed lines are not communicated, and the solid lines are communicated. Um, yeah. But yeah, but all the other results have either, you know, that are not novel, that are replications, have some previous knowledge that we have about them, where the negative novel results that don't get communicated, we don't learn anything about that hypothesis. Okay, so uh, we, this is model uh, we developed and solved totally analytically um, as a sort of using standard techniques from population dynamics. Um, just, uh, just to throw some equations here that are in the supplement of our, our paper that you can look through at your leisure. Um, you know, this is sort of, we get uh, a recursion equation for the number of you know, let's, for each kind of hypothesis, the number of true hypotheses that have state S, or which is tally S, where tally is the number of positive results minus the number of negative results. And we can use this to get steady state equations for the, the frequencies of each kind of hypothesis at each tally. Um, sort of in the long run, these are the steady state uh, Frequency, relative frequencies of the different kinds of hypotheses uh, at each tally. Uh, K is a binomial chooser. Uh, so K, this is a thing to just basically say, like, what is the problem? Basically, it's, you're counting all the different ways to get to a particular tally um, in, a, in you know, however a number of time steps. Um, all right, so the first question we could ask is, how many results with tally S are actually true? Where tally S, tally S equals one, you know, might mean we have one novel result, it might mean two, no, uh, sorry, one positive result, it might mean two positive results and one negative, um, but tally one, as a sort of simplified model of science, how good is this, All right? So there's lots of numbers here, and I'm not, this is, there are seven graphs here that I'm not gonna go through in detail. Uh, again, this is in the paper, but we looked at two scenarios, an optimistic and a pessimistic scenario. Our optimistic scenario is what I presented before, which is uh, base rate of 0.1, power of 0.8, alpha of 0.05, high communication rates. Most, um, most findings are published. Our pessimistic scenario is probably like a lot of research, 
we have a base rate of one in a thousand, power of 0 0.6, alpha of 0.1. Most things are not published. Only about 20% of non-novel positive findings are published here. Um, I want to say before this uh, that once the paper is published, the um, uh, Mathematica notebooks will be online as a supplement. So any particular parameter value you can imagine could be played with, and new, these graphs could be generated. Um, so let's start with the optimistic scenario. If you notice before, most of those lines were flat in the optimistic scenario. The things that matter the most are the base rate and the false positive rate. And what immediately jumps out is that you know, the base rate matters a lot. And in a lot of conditions, you need more than a tally of one to have any sort of certainty uh, that your hypothesis is actually true. Uh, so each line is a tally. So tally zero, tally one, two, three, four. Um, but you, the optimistic scenario is a pretty, well, it's pretty optimistic, but it's a good scenario. Um, as the false positive rate climbs, though, of course, we can be less certain. Uh, there is very good reason to believe that in a lot of research, the false positive rate is actually quite a bit higher than 0.05, as, at least in psychology, as people like uh, Simmons and Simonson have demonstrated there's probably quite a, quite a high false positive rate in that field. Um, in our negative scenario, uh, the base rate, again, and the false positive rate are the things that matter the most. And here, we often need uh, three or four or five replications before we can have a better than chance um, probability that the hypothesis is actually true. We need a lot of positive results to accrue before we can really be certain about uh, a finding. Um, communication also matters in this scenario, though. It, the lines are less steep, but they do matter. And I'm going to talk about that in a, in a few slides after this. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so t a tally zero is, there's a few ways to get it, right? But you, you, know, you need at least one uh, positive result and at least one negative result. Yeah, no, exactly. Nothing has zero communications in this. It means, yeah. So, um, so uh, in the previous one, you'll actually see zero, tally zero falls as the power increases because if the power is very high, then most positives, um, most things that have a negative result will be actually false. Um, OK. So let's talk about communication now um, a little, in a little bit more detail. So Richard and I uh, came up with this sort of analogy of uh, the scientific process, not just doing experiments, but also communicating them as a sort of epistemological chromatography. So for those of you familiar with chromatography, right, this is a process by which um, basically different parts of a solution are separated out uh, through various chemical or physical means. And uh, what science is basically trying to do is we have a whole bunch of hypotheses that we don't know whether or not they're true or false, and we're trying to separate the true ones from the false ones. And this is a gradual process. So uh, this graph here is, uh, has three different uh, values on the lines. Um, the blue is, is what we're calling precision, which is the same as before. This is the probability that something with a given tally is actually true. Uh, but it's not really that helpful if I tell you that all the hypotheses with a tally of five are true if no hypotheses actually have a tally of five. So the orange line is what we're calling the sensitivity, which is the probability that uh, which is basically where the true hypotheses are. It's the probability of a given tally given that the hypothesis is true. And then the specificity is the reverse of that. It's where the false hypotheses are. So we can look at a sort of first pass uh, publication strategy or communication strategy, which is, so I'll, I'll remind you, in all these cases, 
novel, new, novel positive results are always communicated. Uh, in this case, though, we only publish positive results. So we only publish uh, positive neg uh, novel findings and only publish positive replications. So this is sort of Jason Mitchell dream world here. Um, and in this case, it's, it's, it's actually a fairly terrible scenario. Uh, we have pretty high specificity only at very high tallies, six or seven. Uh, this uh, sensitivity is really bad. Most of the true hypotheses are around one. Uh, and the specificity is also around one. Most of the false hypotheses are one because we're not publishing failures to replicate. So things that fail to replicate just don't get published and we get a lot of things with one positive result that are actually false. Um, just for, for completeness, we did the reverse case, which is only publishing negative replications, only publishing failures to replicate, uh, and positive uh, novel results. And this is a terrible situation. This is a uh, most, this basically the precision here is nothing. We don't know when, what, uh, we don't know anything that's true. Most publications at any tally level will be false. Um, don't do this. Uh, so the best scenario we came up with is uh, what we call screen and check, which is don't publish novel negative findings, but publish all novel, but publish all replications whether or not they're uh, confirming or disconfirming. And what uh, you see here is that the precision is quite a bit better, uh, higher than 50% at, at a tally of three. And the sensitivity is not bad. Um, there is a kind of a neat finding here where if you repress uh, positive replications, you actually increase the precision, but at the sort of at the cost of sensitivity. And this is just because um, you're keeping true hypotheses at low tallies in this case. Uh, so this is, this is basically sort of of these three the best because we have the highest precision and the highest sensitivity at lower tallies. Uh, and finally, just there's this, the total communication, which is the publish everything case. Um, and this is not as good. The, you can see the precision is about the same as the screen and check, but sensitivity is way worse. Uh, and this is because basically our journals will just get flooded with negative with, with false false uh, positives. If we're publishing everything, I mean, nobody would really suggest doing this, but this is sort of, you know, as a complete exploration of the model, what if we just published every single hypothesis that was ever tested? Um, most hypotheses are false. Yeah. yeah. Right, well, so, yeah. Uh, right. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Some people have suggested we should publish every negative finding. The problem is, yeah, if most hypotheses are actually false, which I think there's good evidence that that's the case, uh, you're just going to have journals cluttered with, uh, with negative, with, well, with true, uh, true negatives, basically. Um, and it's going to be, you know, if it, maybe we'll have a, you know, if there was a separate journal um, for only those kinds of results, then we could put them aside and then do our, you know, concentrate our search to the journals that aren't that, yeah. 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 So. Well, um, if that's what. Uh, the first thing you said is what I came across as saying, then I apologize, because that's, that's not what I mean. Um, yeah, though, this is definitely within the same formal structure. And this is basically saying that when we look for where the true hypotheses are, they're mostly in things with tally one, because they will occasionally be, uh, because occasionally we'll find a true hypothesis and we'll test it and it'll come up with a positive result. Uh, but most things that we choose to test and most things we choose to replicate uh, will be false. But here it's also just, it's really that most things we choose to test novelly will be false. And we're gonna clutter uh, the sort of landscape of 
communication. So this assumes that sort of all of the whole sort of corpus of scientific results is in one big pool that we're drawing from. So the gray line is where the false, uh, the false hypotheses are. Yeah. So in the gray line, right, most of the, the uh, most of the false hypotheses are a negative one, where they should be at least, right? But the thing is, if the false positive rate is even somewhat significant, like 0.05, and in this case, the base our base rate we're assuming is 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 one in a thousand then most positives will still be true, uh, will be false positives, which is the case in a lot of fields, I think, um, which is why we need replication and why we need, um, well, I'll talk about that at the end, but I mean, there are ways to get the base rate up and to get your false positive rate down to sort of make this condition better. Well, even some physicists. Uh, and, you know, again, these will, uh, the code for all these graphs will be online, so different values can be plugged in and generated. Um, all right, so uh, the sort of last big result then is uh, the objection that, well, replication is all fine and dandy as long as we're assuming that the replications had the same power as the initial studies, but what if they don't? What, what if replications just sort of have smaller sample sizes or different lab expertise or any, for any number of reasons, like the, uh, as some, I think, suspect, uh, people who do replications are out to get the uh, people who did the initial studies, what then? Um, so again, this is from Jason Mitchell, where he assumes that false positives are generally the result of p-hacking, fraud, or some sort of scientific ugliness, in quotes, uh, which totally ignores the fact that a low base rate will generate lots of false positives with, uh, where everyone has the best of intentions and uses the best, best methods available. Um, but so he poses this question, which is if a replication effort were to be capable of identifying empirically questionable results, it would have to employ flawless experimenters. Otherwise, how do we identify replications that fail simply because of undetected experimenter error? This is an important question. And any given replication needs to be scrutinized with at least as much scrutiny as the initial studies, if not more. But what about at sort of at the population level? How do sort of underpowered replications affect uh, the corpus of scientific knowledge? So uh, just as here's an example where we have, you know, again, same parameters as before, a base rate of uh, one in a thousand, alpha 0.05. 20% replication, which is probably pretty high. Um, and uh, we're, always, uh, we're always communicating positive replications. Um, so here's a study where a never uh, novel, uh, so this is a screen and check kind of scenario. Uh, so again, we assume high power uh, for the initial studies of 0.8, but that the replication studies have a much lower power of 0.5. How does this affect things? Um, so on the top graph is the case where we uh, publish all the failures to replicate. And on the bottom graph is where we publish m very few failures to replicate, only 10%. And you can see that in the top graph, the precision is quite a bit higher um, with only a marginal decrease in, uh, in sensitivity. And so we see here that a tally of 0.3 in the full communication, or sorry, a tally of three in the full communication case, uh, you have around an 80% chance that that represents a true hypothesis, whereas you need about uh, a tally of five in the low communication case to get the same precision. Um, so at least in terms of the, the model, uh, the results indicate that suppressing, uh, suppressing negative replication is not a good thing for science on a population level, that we should in fact be publishing failures to replicate because even when they're underpowered, it's still a signal that is, uh, that tells us, that conveys non-trivial information about the true value of that hypothesis. Hypothesis. All right. um, okay, so just to, to, um, to sort of take homes from some of this work, um, 
I mean, clearly, it is not controversial that replication is important. Um, and we just need to remember that replications are vulnerable to the same things that initial studies are. They're uh, problems of low power, high false positive rate, low base rate. Um, many replications might be needed, especially uh, if negative replications are, are suppressed one way or another. Um, I think this speaks also to the fact that you know a lot of people were concerned about the replication thing, saying, uh, "Oh, you know, you this is this is really dangerous because you're ruining people's careers. People make their careers over uh, their big result in their big journal, and then you know then you, this falsification really hurts them." Uh, I mean, part of it, the response to that is too bad, right? That's you know we're scientists and we're after the truth, not you know prestige. Uh, for prestige's sake. Um, the other thing is we should probably stop rewarding initial novel uh, results quite so highly. Um, we should treat most novel results skeptically um, with the sort of, level, you know, sort of appropriate degree of uncertainty um, and caution. Uh, again, so low base rates are, uh, and high false positive rates are the most important threats uh, to the effectiveness of research. Uh, across the board. And so this suggests that we should be focusing our uh, efforts to do something about this, which to a large degree is being done. But um, I think depending on your field, uh, more or less effort probably should be put into this. Um, so a lot of people have been talking about pre-registered data, analy uh, data analysis. We should put our hypotheses um, in before we do the study. Uh, I don't think this should be required for a study because I think exploratory analyses are really valuable, but it also really helps uh, in terms of lowering the false positive rates because we know what we were actually looking for. It also, in the long run, uh, will help us to estimate base rates in a number of fields, um, which is something that we're really interested in doing. Uh, but that data is really hard to get at because most people don't tell you what their hypotheses are before they do the research. Uh, also quality theorizing. Um, you know, clearly in fields like physics, this is pretty well known. Um, in fields like social psychology, maybe less well known. Uh, I've, you know, um, as a theorist, I'm biased because I think that what I do is important. But I think that when we base our experiments and our uh, and our data analyses on things that are well-supported, well-validated, and logically sound theories, we're much more likely to start out with a good probability that what we're looking at is, our hypothesis is true. Yeah. Well, not necessarily. So. That's only if, so yeah, one flavor of pre-registration is this idea that there is a guarantee for publishing regardless of your results. Well, it's registered, right? But you could publish or, let's say, put in a database what the hypothesis was without guaranteeing a journal publication um, of the results. So this is what, um, I was just looking at this uh, database a little bit. The, this thing called tests in the social sciences, like time sharing experiments. Uh, it's an NSF grant um, funded thing where researchers have to propose hypotheses to, um, to be tested uh, against using sort of cloud computing time. Uh, and then there's no, you know, and they do that for the, to the funding agency and then they test the hypotheses and then they, there's no guarantee that that'll be published. I think stuff like that is really valuable. Yeah. It's true. This is a problem we're running into right now. No, I, I, to I totally know. Yeah. No. Yeah, and honestly, I mean, I think pre-registration. There are pros and cons to pre-registration, and I think that it's it's a not a perfect solution, and b not the only solution um, to getting the, the false positive rate down. But it is it is sort of one that's been suggested, and I think has some merit.
Um, and the other, yeah, and I just and I just went on my spiel about uh, how important theory is. So yeah, rah rah theory. Um, also, suppression of initial negative findings might be a good thing uh, if most if most hypotheses are in fact uh, false. Uh, but suppression of negative uh, replications uh, is probably a bad. Thing. Yeah, I mean, so I think what it what it speaks to is uh, a more nuanced view of the sort of scope of results and where we're getting. You know, if we if our database of results is different than a, ra a database of hypotheses, then that might not be a conflict. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the scope of the model. Uh, you know, there is no such thing as a pre-registered hy hypothesis. It's, it's only results, right? This is a this is an outside the model suggestion, rather than an inside the model suggestion. Um, the the last point is definitely an inside the model suggestion. Um, okay. Um, so that's this is what I wanted to say about this model. Um, so. I just, uh, with the last couple slides, I just wanted to talk about some of this or other stuff related to this that we're working on and thinking about. Um, uh, one of them is, is this estimating, trying to estimate the base rate. Um, it's really hard to do. Um, so, you know, it's, we had, we, st uh, we sent this paper uh, uh, for the first, uh, for review, and the, f the first round of reviews came back, and the reviewer said, well, you guys really need to estimate the base rate. Uh, and we were like, that's literally impossible. Um, and they were like, oh, the editor was, well, well if you can't, have, can't estimate the base rate, then we, we're not going to publish it. Um, so uh, I don't know if this is, counts as a, you know, any sort of, uh, well, it's theory, so it's not really a uh, negative or a positive result. but. Um, problems in publication, uh, another issue I won't get into. Uh, but the base rate's probably lower than a lot of people think. Uh, I don't want to say you specifically, hopefully, especially after this talk, are thinking about the fact that your field might have a low base rate, at least sometimes. Um, base rate also, I want to say, is a sort of very broad simplification of fields. I mean, different labs study different things at different times. and. A different lab might have an overall base rate. A different researcher might have an overall base rate. Um, and clearly, some hypotheses are more well motivated than others. Um, but as a sort of, again, broad stroke model type of uh, suggestion, we can say, I think it's pretty reasonable to say, um, what is the sort of a priori probability that a uh, hypothesis in such and such field X is true? Um, which is exactly what you know, medical researchers do. They say, what is the base rate of condition X in this population, even though we know that individuals or uh, sort of different demographic groups have different probabilities once we take that information into account. Um, all right, things like, uh, yeah, there's, you know, this is an issue. Not all hypotheses are actually reported. People, you know, write their papers based on the, based on the data that they have. They don't always tell you what their hypotheses were uh, before. Uh, they did the analysis. There's things like deliberate things like phishing and p-hacking, as well as uh, sort of things uh, what uh, Andrew Gelman has been calling researcher degrees of freedom, which is basically the idea that if you uh, choose what analysis you're going to do after you've seen the data that you have, you're going that's going to skew the kind of analysis you do. Um, generating good hypotheses is difficult, and this is not just in the social sciences, even though I like to pick on them because uh, that's who I work with. Um, but you know things like phlogiston, and the, which is the the substance in the world that causes fire, and uh, luminiferous ether, uh, spontaneous gener generation, the miasma theory of disease, which was that you know there was bad air, and that's what caused cholera. Um, you know these these hypotheses persisted for quite a while before uh, they were overturned. Um, so base rate estimation is an important challenge for data science. It's, um, something I'm just starting to work on now. Um, 
Uh, we also um, had the idea to, to take this modeling framework to uh, help us think about the incentive structures in science. Because a lot of the problems with things like false positives and um, not communicating negative results is that there's very little incentive to publish negative replications or um, to do extremely rigorous work that takes years when there are more PhDs than there are jobs and things like hiring and tenure decisions are made on the basis of number of publications sometimes rather than quality of work, at least for young researchers. Um, and so this is like this really, what I'm going to show you is done like this week. So it's at a very, 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 very early stage. But the idea is sort of to take uh, the framework of the original model of scientists doing this process, make a, a whole population of them uh, that are sort of labs where each lab has their different methods. Uh, and so this, we have this idea that power and false positive rate will be related. So the higher your power, the higher your false positive rate. And how close to that lower right corner your uh, sort of that relationship gets is measured by this er effort criterion. Um, it's, you know, it's a simplification. It's where we're starting now. Uh, the idea is labs uh, get payoffs from publications, especially novel findings, um, but they get a penalty for someone, uh, some other lab failing to replicate their result. Um, and this is uh, an evolutionary simulation where successful labs then create progeny labs and unsuccessful labs fizzle and die out and don't leave any new researchers uh, or you know, grad, successful grad students that go start their own labs. Um, and so, yeah, uh, basically the only result I have from this is that uh, when you have, uh, when, with no replication, the false positive rate climbs and climbs and climbs as labs are just incentivized to put out more output. Uh, once there's replication and those, out, uh, those outputs can be overturned, uh, that creates a check on the false positive rate. Um, so this is the sort of broad direction we're going into next. I don't read too much from these results as they're very preliminary. Um, so, yeah, um, in conclusion, uh, I love this is from The Onion, uh, in, uh, just to, in case anybody thought this was a real article. Um, uh, but it's, I mean, but it's true. It's funny because it's true. Um, science is really, really hard. And the, the joke in this article, right, is that like things like quantum mechanics and uh, you know, molecular crystallography are really, really difficult subjects, and that's totally true. But also just in any field, coming up with really good novel hypotheses is hard, and testing those hypotheses rigorously so that our results um, generate positive or generate the kinds of feedback that is going to help us confirm our hypotheses in a meaningful way is, is difficult. And just, I, I, I think that there's a lot of training that seems to gloss over the fact about it, how really hard this is. Um, so that's just the last point I wanted to make. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, so, so thinking about like where your model might deviate from reality, like yeah. the biggest concern I have is probably around the, the like collection of hypotheses. Right? Because I mean like that's almost certainly not like some sort of like you know uniform kind of you know draw from all possible hypotheses. And in fact there's a lot of selection that goes on. Uh, yeah, so the, the, so the question is about the fact that in the, in the model, hypotheses sort of exist independently of one another, whereas in, in reality, hypotheses are often linked um, through sort of a, a broad theoretical framework or 
you know, parts of them are supported by other parts of, the, of, of others, um, is definitely something we thought about. Um, and the idea was for this model to make it as simple as possible uh, because there really aren't, like this kind of model is pretty new. Uh, there are, um, um, in, this is the, so this is the first model to look at these questions in uh, particular. Um, and, uh, but we definitely have thought about the idea of creating a model where hypotheses exist in this sort of um, n-dimensional space where they can be nearer or farther to each other and cluster in certain ways, um, or even be connected in some sort of network structure. Um, uh, there was actually a neat paper by uh, uh, Jacob Foster and uh, Carl um, Bergstrom on cultural holes in scientific fields that kind of gets at this idea of like, this is a kind of broad stroke uh, kind of idea, but uh, connections and disconnections between uh, different research areas. Um, in terms of the, the robustness of our results uh, to that, I think I think what you you know what you get out of that is linkage in uh, well it's two things at least one is linkage in terms of base rates and uh, power and, and false positive rates within sort of clustered fields uh, and the other is information transfer between findings so your results from one uh, study influence the probability that a different hypothesis that you weren't testing is true. Um, I think the exact relationship is something that I can't answer from our results. Um, there's another thing you brought up, which is that the sort of non-random uh, selection of hypotheses, especially uh, with regard to replication, uh, and that, that is, at least in a simple fashion, something that we did look at, um, because you know, we were sort of like, in the, in the sort of baseline model, we assume that um, replications occur by looking at the body of published literature and picking at random from that something to replicate. And so we thought, well, you know, people shouldn't replicate things that are, they're certain about. If something has you know, five positive replications, it's not really worth my time to go, you know, or I might think it's not anyway, worth my time to go replicate that. Uh, whereas if something that has one positive and one negative result, that's something that's definitely worth uh, replicating. Or something that just has one positive result, I don't know what that is, so I should replicate that. Um, so we did look at that, and I have, I have this is like my one extra slide. Uh, uh, so targeted replication, where uh, with some probability, when there's a replication, I take it from this targeted region, which is things with sort of low certainty. And that does increase um, the sensitivity quite a bit. It doesn't actually increase the precision because it doesn't increase the probability of something being true if it has that tally. It changes the probability of something having that tally. And it, it increases, uh, it, it pushes uh, the true hypotheses toward higher tallies, which is a good thing. So targets. So this is using a, yeah, exactly, sorry. This is using screen and check. Um, and where the, uh, the solid lines are, let's see if I can remember this. Yeah, the, the solid lines are uh, targeting, and the dashed lines are not targeting. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, we did that. That's a great idea. Uh, so it's, it's 
Yeah. Yeah, I was I, I didn't touch on that because I, I I wasn't aware of that actually that thing. Um, that's a great example. Um, there's it does remind me there's something there's uh, something I've been looking at a little bit. Um, Cosma Shalizi, the statistician complexity theorist, has this um, uh, has this blog post he calls sort of like a, a neutral theory of, of insight or something, um, and it's it, the idea is to sort of uh, it's a play on the sort of neutral model of, of evolution and how, you know, how will we expect gene flow to occur when there's absolutely no selection. And so the idea here is what if you have a field where nothing is true? Uh, what, and you know, okay, uh, let's say where, where all hypotheses are wrong. So like parapsychology. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna assert that all hypotheses in parapsychology are probably false. Uh, you, we can argue about this later. Uh, I know we... <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> Get out of my mind! Um, uh, so the idea would be like, okay, like let's take a, a sort of a classical P less than 0.05 threshold. In that case, you know, 5% of initial results will get a, uh, a positive result. But as we do replications, some of those will, you know, will continue to get false positives. Most of them will be correctly shown to, to be false. And as we do meta-analyses, these should drop out of the literature as viable hypotheses. Well, you know, what is the sort of distribution of sort of lifespans of these hypotheses? And then we can compare that to a particular field and say, how, how far off is this? <laughs> um, so we had this idea, we, we've been looking into maybe trying to do this with, with parapsychology, but uh, um, you know, I think the idea of saying, you know, <clears throat> what is the effect of false signals is definitely something, yeah, is, is a great uh, kind of tool for, uh, for checking your methods. So yeah, that's a cool example. Yeah, I think it would be it would be tough in a lot of fields. Um, t well, tougher in let's say tougher in some fields. Um, well, sure. Oh, you, I mean, you could certainly inject noise into a data set, but you're saying, you could also, yeah, give people random data sets or whatever, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd have to think about it some more, or, you know, I should probably all think about it some more. Um, Yeah, uh, that's definitely something, uh, that's, that's definitely really good food for thought. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Oh, there was a question in the back. So, we're always, unless our power is 100%, there's always going to be true things that we don't, we, that we think are false, or that we don't discover. Um, I mean, even if our power is 100%, we have to choose, a, you know, if our hypothesis selection is not amazing, there's going to be things that we haven't discovered yet. There are things we haven't discovered yet. Um, the... Yeah, so I mean, well, the, the, that's basically covered by the, the sort of sensitivity and um, I can't remember what we call it, the specificity 
uh, terms in the model because this is saying w these are where the true hypotheses that have been tested are. This is the tallies that they have. We know, we know as the modelers whether or not a hypothesis is actually true. The researchers in our model don't know. They just know the tallies. So we're saying under these conditions, this is the probability that a false hypothesis has a tally of blah, and this is the probability that a true hypothesis has a, a tally of blah. And sometimes a true prob there's a non-zero probability that true hypotheses have tallies that are negative uh, in all, most of the conditions in our model. Uh, Yeah, and when that's a, a right. Well, so yeah. So, I mean, that's the, yeah. Uh, so this is, um, I mean, this is almost like it's like the difference between you know evolution, descent by not modification, and like abiogenesis. Where did life come from? They're they're sort of separate questions. Um, you know, yeah, hypothesis selection is a really important thing, so, you know, we don't leave out, we want to, you know, we want to discover all the truth about the world. Um, but once we've, once we have a hypothesis that some people take seriously, then we want to evaluate it. Um, and, you know, yeah, they're both important questions, and our model really only looks at the, the second one. So the question was, uh, basically, if, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, that, that uh, you know, so what, we, what we've looked at here is the sort of uh, steady state ideal case of um, the system evolving to a, to a point where basically this is, the, this is the level of true hypotheses versus false hypotheses and where they tend to be on average relative to other hypotheses. And you're saying that in, a, in a sort of the, the, the real life dynamical system of science, the, you know, the number of true hypotheses or false ones at a given, you know, that are viewed to be with, uh, viewed with certain degrees of certainty will fluctuate. Is that, is that basically right? Yeah, I just want to say, we're, the, the researchers ourselves have identified the probability of hypotheses to be right the well, so so in so in this case, the there's no um, in this case the the researcher isn't doing any sort of um, subjective assessment of the probability. This is the uh, probabilities here of being right are true probabilities given a random draw from all things with a given tally. Um, you know in. Uh, I was just reading an article by John Unides where he was talking about the, the sort of ebb and flow of the rigor of science and how you know good um, various fields are, or the sort of you know rate at which we separate true hypotheses from false ones, or come up with with better or worse theories, is not necessarily a linear progression, and there are different stops and starts, and um, you know, bo you know boosts and uh, fallbacks. Uh, and that, uh, yeah, the model, this model at least, doesn't, doesn't cover anything like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely important. Yeah. 
so yeah, so the you know this yeah the question is about um, well let me just say like everything you said is is stuff that we have talked about at length and thought about it is um, yeah I mean uh, the question is related to variation between hypotheses in terms not just of truth and falseness but also in terms of um, sort of utility for society or whatever or and also surprise level basically like science and nature are interested in publishing yes useful findings but also surprising findings um, things that were like well we always we always thought that was true and we just didn't have a good proof that often doesn't get into things like nature and science unless it's something that really changes the game um, you know uh, it turns out that like you know uh, tyrannosauruses could fly that would be probably, well, it's probably wrong, but it would probably still might go into nature. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, both of these things do change the dynamics um, of what gets published where and what gets funded. And that, I think, at a, to bring it back to the kinds of things we looked at in this model, I think that that kind of thing can change um, base rates of, of truth and falseness when we, you know, direct our searches to, let's say, where the funding dollars are or, uh, you know, what we think is going to be the big sell. Um, no, I mean, I think it can change a lot of things. Um, but, I like, it, that kind of thing... There's not a, I don't think there's an easy parameter switch that, it, that um, relates to that kind of dynamic in, or the kind of situation that you're talking about in this model. Um, I think that for the incentives model, you know, one thing that we did talk about was, and again, we're, st this is, uh, it's, we're still sort of exploring possible models for analysis there. But yeah, one thing we did talk about was the utility of, um, you know, do we, do we try to publish something that's really surprising? Do we try to um, submit it to somewhere that's really high impact, given that we have a high probability of rejection, but, uh, you know, a possible high payoff? Um, do we just do a new study rather than do all the revisions that the reviewers requested? Um, and these are things that are going to affect the dynamics of what gets published and where and when. Um, and that's something that we've thought about but haven't looked at yet. Okay. <laughs> sure. So, it would. Well, I mean. On the surface, uh, it does seem to imply that, and it that might be true. Uh, certainly, I mean, it's skewed. Like Retraction Watch, the website has, you know, they tend to feature things from Nature and Science and PNAS quite a lot, and Cell also. There was a thing like a lot of these, but again, those are also the things that are tend to be targeted for replication, the high impact. So there's there's a skew there, and you know. Are things, you know, are these things more likely to be, do we know that they're more likely to be false because they're actually more likely to be false, or is it just because that's where we're looking, we're concentrating our replication? Probably they are more likely to be false than, let's say, high impact uh, but field uh, centric journals because they place a higher value on surprise. Yeah. Uh, No. Uh, so yeah. uh, you can also imagine that so the one of the studies you brought up is the meta analysis of cancer research. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so 
so the answer to that question is like clearly yes, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Clearly, there are, you know, if we're talking about things where there are financial incentives in, in private industry toward something being true, there's you know, I mean, look at climate change. Um, Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we hear about you, anecdotally you hear all the time about people reviewing papers and trying to get them rejected when they disagree with their, you know, the reviewer's own hypothesis. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a it's a problem. Um, well, I mean, what you're basically saying here is that someone has a vested interest in something not being shown to be the case. And with the novel hypothesis, there is, let's just, you know, in the sort of idealized model version of it, there's zero information about it. So there might be the, the likelihood that somebody is basing their whatever livelihood on the assumption that such and such is the case when there's no evidence. Um, seems to be probably less of a fat, yeah, it would probably be less um, of a, you know, a, strenu a strenuous feeling or whatever than someone having a vested interest in something that has been shown to be the case or might be the case. They might base, yeah, their livelihood on that one finding or whatever a series of findings. And yes, of course, they would then have, um, if you can say, point to evidence that your business is based on a, a reasonable model, Everybody wants to be able to do that, or you know, many people want to be able to do that. And so, yeah, I, I think um, the answer is yes, <laughs> right? Like, um, there probably is uh, in some cases. I mean, but again, this is, uh, there, yeah, there probably is in some cases um, more of a problem with incentive structures like this influencing replications than in terms of novel findings. But there are probably counterexamples too. So um, I can only speak generally. Okay, um, well, thanks so much, this was fun. <laughs>